So here is the subtraction running record. So the processes of giving the running record is the same with the, uh, as with the addition, only I have found it very, very different uh, in administering so many of these to students. I have found that addition is very linear progression. So the strategies, students tend to go one by one and one strategy leads very naturally to the next one. But with subtraction, I have found it kind of different. There are different kind of hot spots of different standalone type strategies and thoughts. And I have found a few to be particular ones where they get hung up. So uh, it's just been very fascinating to see the difference between giving the addition and the subtraction. Here we have the benchmark sheet. So the, the process of giving it is the same. I would put the sheet in front of the student and I would say, we're going to do a running record today. We're going to go over your answers to some of these expressions. And then we'll go back to the beginning and talk about your thinking. And I'll be taking some notes so that I can make sure that I will be able to help you to get even better at math and what you need. And so this, this sheet will be right in front of them. They won't have anything in their hands or anything. And then I have this recording sheet in front of me. So here is a recording sheet for subtraction. This, these middle codes here um, are particular to subtraction, where now we can be head counting back, we can be finger counting back, uh, or we can be using addition. We can be using related facts uh, and, and thinking about the addition problem as a missing add end um, with a subtraction problem. So if I think of 15 minus 8, I can think, well, what can I add to the 8 to get the 15, I'm, I'm using a related fact. If I know 8 plus 7 is 15, um, so I know the answer must be the 7. So uh, some different codes that we have on here. We still have self-correcting and uh, attempted self-correct. We still have the in context. So again, when I found students looking at just the numbers, some of the youngest kiddos will say they have no idea because they're looking at the numbers. But when I give it in the context of a word problem using the same numbers, like let's say you had four cookies and you um, ate three of them, then they're able to give me the actual answer. Um, and some cannot. So again, I'm trying to find what information uh, I can gather to give to the teacher to know exactly how to respond instructionally to the needs of the kids. So we have these codes here, uh, the uh, automatic, five seconds of prolonged thinking, because I have found that uh, students, there's kind of a middle of the road. So the original protocol Dr. Nikki had, the automatic and prolonged thinking were there, but I did find there were kids in the middle. So some kids can be automatic and within three seconds or so, and other kids are super prolonged thinking, but there are some that get it within five or six seconds. So I want to know that to be able to know how I can plan uh, instructionally. I also would put a check mark if they got the answer correct and an X if they get it wrong, but I also would put the number that they said. Now, particularly here in subtraction, some students will add. They won't recognize that it was a subtraction sign. So I want to be able to be aware, like, what did they say is the answer? So I can do some kind of error analysis and figure out what they were thinking um, in this part one. Because in part one, I'm not going to ask them how they did it or what they were doing. I'm only making notes if they're obvious and circling codes if they're obvious. Now, there is another version of this running record, which does not have the codes in these boxes, because I actually prefer not having those codes there. So we're offering both uh, the one with the codes and the one without the codes for you, whatever you like better. We have the codes over on the side going in the progression to explain what the code is for down below uh, and putting it in words for you. Here we again have the codes written out for you of what they mean. Now this general observation section, that uh, I have found, that that's what you're going to be doing after the whole interview is done. When I was working on these, the backside part two and part three was back there as well. It was already too much on the page. So I didn't want to be able to break apart and have part of part two on the first page. And I did want to get it down to two pages because in my district, you know, using paper and doing these three times a year on all kids, it's a lot of paper. So I wanted to get it down to just a one two sided page for us. So this section here, then you're going to skip until the end. So that general observation is done after the whole interview is done. Once part one is done, and I, get, I do stop it when I feel like the students are making several mistakes or if they are getting really prolonged thinking, it should not be agony for the kids. We're just trying to get information for ourselves of where can I begin working with this child. So once you have a sense of knowing it, you can. You know, we're not using this for gradings at all. So going through all of them isn't a necessary thing. So. Then I go on to part two. Now, this is where I want to interview the kids and really delve deep. What did you just do? What did your brain just think? Where did you begin? If they said that they, they counted on, well, where did you begin? What number did you begin counting on? I, I need to know all those facts so I can know what my instructional response is going to be. So here we have a more generalization of these strategies as well. So not only do I know whether students can do four minus zero is four and six minus zero is six, but what happens when you take zero away from any number? It could be anything. So we're kind of generalizing that into a property for the takeaway zero, takeaway one. Um, I have put down here on the recording sheet the most common 
ways of um, of thinking about it. So knowing that it's the same number or if they can't articulate it. Now, if the students are able to answer the question relatively quickly and, and be accurate with it, I'm not going to make them work in that zone if their only problem was the articulation of the strategy. So I want to make a note of that, though. I want to address that and I want to make sure that I'm helping students be able to explain their thinking. It's one of our math practices is to be able to explain explain their thinking. So, uh, so it's not that it's not important. It's just that in terms of what math facts do I want them to be using, uh, I'm not going to make them work in that particular strategy just if they couldn't articulate articulate it. I, I do want to work on that. Um, so then we have subtracting one. They know that it's the previous counting number. Taking away a number from itself. So this is a new one um, to know that it's always going to be a zero no matter what it is. We have the do you know the strategy, the no emerging or yes. So no is if they have no way of attacking it. They just say that they don't know. They're not using anything. Um, whereas emerging could be if they are getting some of them wrong in that zone. So maybe they, they're attempting to count on, but they're getting a wrong answer. So they're emerging. They're, they're having a strategy to attack it. It's just that uh, they're not accurate with that. So they haven't fully mastered that strategy yet. We certainly want them to be accurate. So, um, so that emerging is there. Or perhaps, uh, as I found with the addition, I think doubles plus one in particular, a lot of students know five plus six is an 11 because the benchmark of five is so strong, the five and five being a 10. When I ask them six plus seven, they start counting on their fingers or head counting on. So they're emerging, right? They're using a strategy for one of the facts, but the other fact they didn't. So they're just emerging in that zone. And then we have the levels. So we have the codings, the 0, 1, 2, 3, that 4M, meaning that they memorize them. So, uh, you know, if there are students who have memorized the answers, you know, if it's accurate and fine, I have found students tell me that they, that they just knew it but it was wrong. So it, it's hard to fix that thinking when they're not even going to uh, know that an answer isn't reasonable or not realize that they're, that they're wrong. So that 4M is important because this four is going to mean that they are, you know, they have automaticity, so relative speed, accuracy, but they also understand they can explain it. So that's a, a valued score of that four on that journey. So then we have, uh, the, you know, subtracting within five and from five. Here is the first hiccup. I do find students get hung up here, the subtracting within 10. This is the first time that I want to be able to, actually within five, I might um, introduce this as well in talking about it. But um, this is where I really begin talking about the flexibility that I can use. I can count back. You know, I can count back from a certain number, but I also could count up. So that, that inverse relationship of addition and subtraction is really, really important because depending on the numbers, I find myself, this is how I think now at, you, using these strategies. I've done it so often. I've changed the way my brain uh, is functioning. So I'm no longer imagining the algorithm in my head. I now have number sense and I'm be able to do much more mental math than I ever could have before, but that I need to have some tools in my toolbox. I've got to be able to know that I could use addition to solve subtraction if I want to. So let's say that I have this nine minus two. If I want to count, if I know I can count back the two, that, that takeaway understanding of subtraction, nine, eight, seven, seven, I'm done. My two seconds, you know, count back is only a couple of seconds. I'm within that nice um, automaticity kind of zone of three seconds or, or below, uh, and I'm accurate, right? So I'm done. So that's great. So that's good. That's a good strategy to use for that. But when I have done down below two, two problems later, the eight minus six, if I'm going to start my eight and count back six, I'm going to be out of my three seconds. So now, or someone could be a very fast counter and that's true too. But I want to introduce to those kiddos the idea that, well, you could start with the lower number and add up find that distance. This distance method between the two numbers is hugely important to understand subtraction. I think typically we've done subtraction problems. We make up uh, problems top of our head. We tend to do takeaway where things are being broken or they're eaten or they're going away. Whereas that comparison problem type of if I have seven and you have four, how many more do I have or how many fewer do you have? There's nothing going away. I've got my seven. You've got your four. No one's eating or breaking anything. It's just how many more do I have than you? That's a distance understanding of subtraction. So it's actually um, one of the most frequently tested versions of using subtraction, but it's probably the least often kind of problem types we get in front of the kids. Um, so really important to work on that flexibility if I could count up or I could count back, or I could think about what can I add to the number to get to my original number, that, that menu end. So here's the first place where I find that really works well to talk about and, and to work in that zone with the kids using concrete objects, you know, manipulatives, the um, using uh, pictorial representations of these, and then Get going to the abstract numbers and practicing that flexibility of thought, depending on what the numbers are. So that's the first kind of hiccup stop sign I find with kids. Then we have some kind of t standalone ones. We have, you know, the numbers that um, when you take away from a 10, that that's 
crucially relying on do they understand they're adding within 10. Now, if you're following a progression of having students work on adding within 10 before they enter the subtraction within 10, they should have that in place, right? They shouldn't be on the subtraction zone if they haven't finished the adding within 10 strategies. So they should have those automatized doing those pairs of numbers of 10s so that when I do now take a number away from a 10, oh, well, if I know 6 plus 4 make a 10, 10 minus a 6 must be that 4 and 10 minus a four must be that six. So really important relationship there. Then we have the uh, difference of one or two. These are just the understanding and seeing numbers on number lines and next to each other on a number lines. We know that just the difference is one. I don't have to count back or anything. It's just, they're just separated by one or two. Then we have the decomposition of T numbers that they're made up of a 10 and a ones. I love using uh, Cuisinier rods for this because they literally have one rod that's the 10 and one rod that represents the grouping of numbers. So they're getting away from the counting by ones or seeing the seven of a 17 existing as a group. I can take away the 10 and left with the seven, take away the seven and left with the 10. So I, I do like using that as a concrete uh, for that strategy and then take away the ones as well. And then we have the half facts. Now, a lot of students get hung up here because they don't recognize them as being half facts. They know they're doubles facts but they haven't related that to be a half fact that we if we know our doubles and what they are taking away one of them will leave the other so uh, i do find this as a hookup for the kids a lot it won't take long to work on it with them because we want them recognizing those teen doubles facts but uh but still it's, it's nice to have them understand that as a half fact and then we have the bridge 10 strategy now this is the one that's going to get them furthest on their journey um of course a lot of our math facts in subtraction are in this zone so it might look that the kids are oh they're at the end of their journey but those are all the math facts really that hang up our kids and when we're looking at students working grades three to five they're doing a division problem they have to subtract within that division problem usually it's a 15 minus eight within that problem that they're counting back on their fingers they're not using any efficient strategies so um so this bridge 10 you know yes we want kids to be at the end of the zone here but there is work to be done before they can be said that they're done on their subtraction strategies but here is the the brilliance of this progression is if you've worked on your adding numbers within 10 you and you sorry subtracting within 10 and you're used to counting up and counting back and having that flexibility well now we have subtract bridge 10 we can use the 10 to help us do these um mental math strategies so if i have a 12 minus an 8 well, 8 and 12 are relatively close together. I don't want to count back in 8. I want to think of the distance between 8 and 10. And if I use addition, I know 8 and 2 make a 10. How do I know that? Well, I did that in my addition progression. I know 8 and 2 make a 10. So I know that chunk can get me to 10. And I've also worked on my decomposition of T numbers. So I know a 10 to a 12 is just 2. So now I'm adding 2 and 2, which is my 4. That's very different than starting at 12 and counting back 8. A lot of students are very inaccurate. So by working on the flexibility in these strategies, we're automatically working on their speed and their accuracy. They're going to be working in chunks and having number sense. They'll be more accurate, and they will get faster the more that they are practicing these. So this is that same idea. I'm going to count back, or I'm going to uh, – I can, I can take it if I wanted to. If I were to be given 12 minus 3, well, I could do – go back two to 10, take away one more to get to my nines, that kind of takeaway, but with using chunks. Um, Cause it's, but I could also start with a three and do seven and three, make a 10. And then I have um, the two more. So it, it depends on what we are, um, you know, the numbers that are given, what our brain wants to do. We're not dictating any particular strategy so much. I mean, some, a lot of students gravitate toward the doubles and all, but this um, strategy of bridge 10 will progress itself to the nearest 10. So if I'm asking you to figure out, let's say 52 minus 48, well, I don't want to take away 40 and then take away an eight. Why don't I, I can think of addition. I can think of 48 plus two makes 50 plus two more makes 52. So I have my four again. Um, or I can think subtractively, again, doing that distance from 52 to 48, I can go back two and then back two to get to my four. But what if we do fractions? What if we say like, you know, one and one fourth take away three fourths, rather than regrouping and that whole is four fourths and I'm trying to do all these um, different ways of thinking about things. What if I think, well, three fourths plus a fourth is a whole plus another fourth is one and a fourth. It's got to be two fourths. That's going to translate itself to those mental math strategies more so than ever before. Um, and students will be following those procedures mindlessly and not realizing that their answers aren't reasonable. So this is kind of the key to everything here. So that bridge 10 is crucially important. And then of course we have the subtract from 20. But again, you can think of those two pairs of numbers that make a 10 to help you with that as well. I'm doing 20 minus eight. Well, if I know that an eight and a two make a 10, it's gonna be ending in a two. It's gonna have a one's place uh, that's a two. So it's gonna be the 12. So then we're testing for the flexibility here because um, 
can you can I do that in more than one way with that flexibility of thought? Can you think in more than one way? So we have that question there on there for them. Then, of course, the really important disposition, part three of, of do you like math and what do you do in your um, stock and those kind of things. Important for us to know that. Once we're going through the entire protocol, and again, I will stop it on the backside for sure. Once I get to a zone where I know that they're working in, because time is of the essence, we all need to uh, get back and, and teach the kids, of course, and giving these I know can be time consuming, but I have seen a lot of people give a lot of time to literacy testing. Uh, we've given found some Pinnell in our district, which is super valuable and again, incredibly important information, but it takes time. And students can take 20 minutes or half an hour um, on a book, let's say, whereas we're asking for equity with math that we do the interview um, as well. So then I'll go back to my general observations, what I can do after the interview is done, and I will circle whether they need flexibility, accuracy, and autoticity, or all three. You know, what are the zones they need to be aware of to work on? Here we have the progression of the strategies. You want to circle the strategy that they are working in right now. As a data, data entry person, when I was my math, okay, math coach in my uh, in my school, I would be entering in this data. So I want to enter that code in the spreadsheet so I can sort it for the teacher, give them their uh, listing of students and see what they need to be working on. And then the small groups were already done. We know these four kids need this and these four kids need that. So, um, so that this code here is what they need to work on. And here, this level for the strategy, that's going to be the, the number that is in that zone, what was the problem? So when they, when they started slowing down, when they made a mistake, what strategy did they fall back on? Our brain tends to go back to strategies that we're most comfortable with, which is why the fingers come out, because we use that when we're younger and we know that um, that it works. So in fact, I've, I've, um, I, I heard from Christina Tonneville, the one of her presentations once that uh, professional bicyclists will pedal backwards when they're about to get into an accident because their brain in a moment of stress goes back to what they're comfortable with. And when we were all kids, we pedal backwards, the bike stopped. So they know their bike isn't going to stop, but the brain just kind of kicks into that drive. So the fingers tend to come out a lot when they're using um, not familiar strategies and feeling confident in it. So um, you want to circle the, the level here so that when I get this sheet and I type it into my spreadsheet and I'm printing that for teachers, the teacher will know, okay, this student is working on the half facts. And what they were doing where they were uh, was they were doing mental counting. So the number two would tell me, oh, they were counting back in their head. I want to work on some visualization of, of seeing double number lines or um, double 10 frames and Cuisinier rods. I want to work on that so they can visualize what's happening with the half act. So it'll help us direct our instruction, again, by the coding of the, flu the flexibility, accuracy, automaticity, what strategy zone of math facts, and then what was their level with that particular uh, strategy. So have fun, grab a student, uh, a child, your kid, a, a neighbor, get them in and, and just have a conversation with them. You'll be amazed at what you learn. So have fun and take care. Feel free to give any uh, comments or questions you have as you are doing them. Uh, can't wait to continue our conversation. Okay, take care.